The objective of this book was to examine the trading and economic relationship with the BRICS. I wanted to put in a book and document what that relationship is. A lot of people talk around about it. They talk a bit about this, a bit about that. I want to have a comprehensive overview of what exactly the relationship is. The emphasis is on agriculture. It's written by a collaboration of authors and uh, two of my colleagues are here. And a special thanks to the NAMC for the funding for this book. The summary, you also have a standalone summary as well as the summary being in the main part and it's designed to be just that, a summary. Uh, the presentation I'll give now is a summary of the summary. If you read nothing else, at least have a look at the summary. It won't take you very long. And Colin McCarthy made a, a promotion of the book before. He suggested some royalties. I've agreed with Colin. He will have part of the royalties from the sale of these books. Uh, in economics, marginal value should always equal marginal, uh, marginal cost, and that's what you should price at. So we are pricing the book at zero, which may tell you something <laughs> about the marginal value. And I'm giving Colin a percentage of that. <laughs> so the summary is a standalone piece. It's also in the book, but it's designed to give you a feel for what is in each and every chapter. Are We a Brick is the introduction. Uh, and it starts off, the conclusion is, well, what is a brick? The bricks are basically judged against the stellar performance of India and China. But when you take the other two, their performance is not as stellar and similar to South Africa's. South Africa, unfortunately, has lost global share in trade. And the others, uh, well, particularly India and China and lately Brazil, are increasing their share of international trade. South Africa is a much smaller economy than the other BRICS. Unemployment is South Africa's Achilles heel, as everybody knows. And what I'm effectively saying is that we, South Africa, is not a BRIC as of right. So it is a special position to be invited in there. One thing that this book does not do, there's not an extra chapter at the end which looks at the policy and what we recommend South Africa should do. The book is designed to lay out the basic economic trade and uh, rela relationships, not look at the policy issues. So I haven't got into that. The BRICS and Africa. This is written by uh, Taku, who's just left Trellick. And I think it's a very nice political economy piece of the, uh, the issues involved. How does South Africa and Africa fit into the the newly developing world and the BRICS in particular. This is becoming a very important question as South Africa and Africa moves to a higher growth path and the crawly of that is that European Union and the US are moving to somewhat lower growth paths. So that changes the whole dynamics of the world around. The bottom line, I think, is the resources will still dominate. Uh, is it a new form of colonialism? The important part for South Africa and Africa in general is to be very firm and be much stronger on negotiating, I think, their positions and better governance will help that a great deal. I think that's a nice, there's a nice chapter on the political economy of the BRICS Africa and how the, the big picture fits together. FDI in South Africa from a BRIC perspective, uh, I'd take the data from the South African Reserve Bank, look at foreign direct investment, portfolio and other, which is sort of what's left over. People always concentrate on FDA. That's only about perhaps a quarter to a third of the total. The portfolio investments are generally more important. The bottom line is the European Union is by far the most important source of funds and the destination of South African funds, and the US is the second most. The most of the assets held abroad by South Africa are portfolio, <coughs> and China is becoming an increasingly important both source and a destination for South Africa's funds, but it's still a much lower percentage. 
Chinese domination of the African industrial goods market. We've heard a lot in the last day and a half about industrialization, industrialization policy. My thesis, very briefly, is that I think South Africa's missed the bus. South Africa in the early 90s had an opportunity. It had very high technology and technical capacity. It had a lot of uh, low and unemployed, uh, low wage labor. It has not been able to bring those two together. Collins uh, said this morning that it said it didn't want a low wage economy. The problem is that it's finished up with a no wage economy. And China to Africa, there's just a short table there between 2000, 2001 average and 2008, 2009. And it's South Africa, uh, it's sorry, uh, China's <coughs> industrial goods exports to the world, to Africa and to RSA, Republic of South Africa. Each case that's more than doubled over that period and is increasing. And I think that's cut out South Africa's opportunities, one, because South Africa is in effect almost destroying the industrial base, uh, China's destroying the industrial base in South Africa. It's making it much more difficult for South Africa to export to Africa, and the US market has been the traditional market for industrial exports from the Asian developing economies, and China has cut that out from South Africa's reach. So I think the problem is, all we well talk about industrial policy and everything, but I think to a large extent, that bus is gone. The BRIC agricultural exports to Africa, are they a threat? The answer is yes. They're increasingly becoming a threat. Again, in the middle there, there's the three percentages, BRICS exports to the world and BRICS uh, agricultural exports to Africa and to South Africa. And you can see that the BRICS are increasing quite a bit in both categories. So I used to, we used to term, or I used to term in the work that I do for BRICS, with a big S includes South Africa, BRICS with a small S is the old BRICS. It's very confusing when you're talking about BRICS. And if it's BRICS with a big S, that means South Africa. If it's got a small S, it's the old four BRICS. And the data very clearly shows that Brazil, in particular, is starting to compete and outcompete South African agricultural exports in the African market. And more significantly, South Africa is losing market share in every market in Africa except Zimbabwe. And when you start to look at the high value added, the more processed goods, the disconcerting thing there is that South Africa is also losing ground in the higher pro um, things like sauces and infant food and uh, the high value products. South Africa, unfortunately, is losing ground in those to the BRICS. Even in things like apple and grape exports into Africa, South Africa is losing ground in some of those issues. So yes, the BRICS are competing very heavily in Africa at the expense of South Africa. Converse is South African agricultural exports to the BRICS and the prospects. Short answer is that these are very low. They are about 6% of agricultural exports in 2010. That's increasing, it's in, but increasing slowly. Uh, encouragingly, where South Africa is exporting to the BRICS, those exports to the BRICS are an important percentage of the total South African exports in that particular line. So if the line is something, I don't know, cucumbers, whatever, the uh, exports to the BRICS may not be high, but they are very important as a percentage. So that is uh, more encouraging. Overall, South Africa is less than 1% supplier to any of the BRICS for agricultural products. Tariffs are not generally an issue but non-tariff barriers are an issue and increasing. I'll just toss in there the New Zealand FTA with China, wool and skins. There's another paper in the Trellick pipeline that I've written looking at the free trade agreement between New Zealand and China and the implication for South Africa. And that's linked with the BRICS as well. And uh, 
I enjoyed writing that paper. That was quite interesting. This is my favorite paper in the book, The Rise and Rise of Brazilian Agriculture, What Does It Mean for South Africa? It's a huge story, Brazilian agricultural production and exports over the last 20 years or so, driven by technology, which in turn has changed land use patterns. Uh, conversely to what most people think, it has not been the clearance in the Amazon rainforest, it's been the development of what is land that is analogous to the savanna in Africa. And the Brazilian scientists use technology to introduce mostly soybean crops that were nitrogen fixing and could adjust to the acid soils. And that changed from extensive cattle farming to intensive cropping to very high technology. It's a superb story and I think it's got major lessons for uh, South Africa, but Africa in particular. The other big issue in Brazil, of course, is sugar. And sugar is around about half ethanol, half sugar as, as we know it. And that's another interesting issue for South Africa. The South Africa, the Brazilians are becoming victims of their own success and that their currency is appreciating. Their costs are rising. They're finding the same thing as the Asian growth economies did earlier on with rising uh, values of their currency, they're becoming less competitive, <coughs> but they're still very competitive in sugar. So there's major issues there to look at for Africa in general, South Africa in particular. Agriculture in Russia, India and China is a synopsis of looking at the agricultural profile and performance in each of those countries. China is the most interesting one I've written previously and done uh, quite a bit of work in China looking at that, written papers on that. China, again, technology, they lifted the small peasant farmers out of poverty mainly through technology. And that, to me, has massive implications to look at that story to Africa. And Africa has got to do the same, and the Chinese is a very good example to look at and how to do it. First of all, getting all your policies right. Um, people talk about the enabling policies. They got that right. They got their agricultural policies right. They poured in enormous amount of technology and they developed a lot of extension. Now, to get a, a handle on the, the size, we're talking about 200 million peasant farmers with around about 0.6 of a hectare each. So these are small farmers that were lifted out of abject uh, poverty. Big issues for Africa and implications. South African agricultural imports and policy space looks at how much room there is to actually raise tariffs in South African agricultural imports. The answer is very little because a lot of it's locked in with either the TDCA, imports from SADC, or WTO commitments. So step by step we go through and look at how much room there is to increase tariffs. The answer is very little. Chickens are one example that there may be some room to increase tariffs, but increased ex imports are coming in from the EU, which is going to complicate that little piece of policy space as well. This is just for agricultural imports. Trade remedies, will I mean will present on that one. Total factor productivity in agriculture, computer simulation. Benani, my colleague, will, uh, will discuss that one. Now, this is another one of my favorite ones. South Africa's way ahead, into the mist. Look in there, uh, this was brought up this morning as a question. The BRICS are the big talking point. But when you look at the list of GDP, you go down the list of world GDP, you find when you look at the developing countries, the top four are the BRICS. The next four down you've got are the MIST. The MIST are between 14th and 18th in the world, so they're tightly bunched together there. So it's a bit of a no-brainer to pick these four out. Mexico, Indonesia, South Korea, and Turkey. And I look at the trade and economic relationships South Africa with those, uh, emphasis on agriculture, and look at the BRICS 
trading relationship with the MIST and look at possible opportunities there. I look at what the MIST countries and agriculture are importing, what they're importing from the world, what South Africa is exporting to them, but more importantly, what South Africa is not and potentially could export to them. So there's quite a lot of detail in there on the BRICS. Uh, they're becoming increasingly important. I sort of, I use the fr uh, phrase baby BRICS. And once you put in the mist and the BRICS of South Africa, you've got a fairly large percentage of South-South trade. Now the next acronym is ASA, Argentina and Saudi Arabia. And you heard it from me first. You've heard of the mist, you've heard of the BRICS, but you haven't heard of this one before. <laughs> ASA. Uh, again, not very smart. All I did was take the next two on the list. And that's Argentina and South Africa and discuss why they potentially could be important to South Africa. And I agree that, uh, yes, South Africa's got to keep an eye on this, particularly Saudi Arabia as a gateway into the increasingly prof prosperous Middle East. And then the next level down you've got are the African countries and from 30 to 40, I think there's five or six African countries in there but they are quite a bit below that, so I didn't get into that next level down. It's all about GDP growth. And looked at the, did a little bit of extrapolation on GDP growth for China. This debate was when will China be the world's leading economy, et cetera, et cetera. The true question there, of course, is when will China regain its position as the world's leading economy? And the answer to that is depend, of course, it depends on economic growth, it's going to happen, but it could be a, f a little bit longer than people think, because even though you have high growth from a lower base, it takes you a lot longer to, um, to actually catch up in absolute terms. It also depends whether you're talking in absolute terms or per capita. In absolute terms, China will overtake the US in not too distant future, per capita, long way off. The final chapter, the BLNS, the BRICS trading relationship and perspective. And this is mostly tables. I think there's something like 43 tables in this chapter. But I go through, look at the, each of the BLNS and the aggregate, the big picture, the aggregate, uh, the disaggregated data to each of the BLNS, to each of the BRICS, to Europe, to South Africa where the data is available and to the EU and try and put that in perspective. The, the final point um, is that the, the BLNS um, are importing a little bit from the BRICS. They're e importing more than they're exporting, but there are areas in there where the BRICS are important. But the EU and the US are much more important as export destinations. Okay, thanks, and thanks again to Trellick, NAMC, Sweden and Danish donors and my colleagues. Okay?